Welcome to our second Milestones viewing party. Please join the conversation on our Google Hangout page or via Twitter, and the hashtag is Milestones. So last week we had a great discussion with uh, Greg Coleman, uh, Mr. Elementary School Math blogger, who helped us talk about milestones in math. And this week we are focusing on writing and how to help your child write with Melissa Taylor, who is a mother, a writer, a teacher, and author of several books, including Book Love, How to Help Your Child Grow from Le Reluctant to Enthusiastic Reader, and um, the award-winning blog, Imagination Soup, which has this great subtitle, Bite-Sized Wisdom for Thinking Parents, and it's a great blog. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you for having me. It's fun to be here. Um, I wanted to start out talking about our new Milestones videos a little bit, uh, yeah. which show what children should be learning in reading, writing, and math from kindergarten through fifth grade. And the writing videos are really interesting because I think a lot of parents don't know how writing is taught, whether it's taught, how it should be taught. And, and these videos really unpack that and really show not just what kids can be expected to do, but also what the process of writing is. And um, it's, it, it reveals some really surprising things about what writing is at different ages. Um, Melissa, you chose a couple of videos that you wanted to talk about uh, what kindergarten garden writing looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, as one, parents of kindergartners should check out. And what, what was it that struck you about this particular video? I love the I love the videos. I think they're all worth watching. I thought it gave it sort of starts parents out with the right message of what is expected of uh, young writers when they're just starting out and then as they're progressing along. But it you know it starts with uh, what kids can do and what kids can do is they can draw and they can match the sounds to letters. So they're not necessarily needing to be identify or writing words all the way but they're getting the hang of it and they're just starting and that's appropriate de developmentally and a really great place to start from as they grow every year and, and as a writer mm -hmm. um, the, the, the ki the, that, those early videos certainly kindergarten and first and second grade uh, uh, show a lot of drawing mm -hmm. so I think that might be surprising to some parents. Yeah, well, and you think about the act of writing, it really starts out as scribbling. It is really drawing. And, and, and when children are first learning their letters, to them, it is a drawing. It's, and that's why they reverse their letters, because sometimes they're, they don't see it as a letter yet. They see it as a, a shape, a drawing. So that's where you want to start. But also because kids uh, feel really comfortable drawing. So if you start with the drawing, then add the writing, they're feeling stronger about what they're saying, the story, or the topic that they're writing about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another video that you talked about was the one that's called Second Grade, what second grade writing looks like. And um, what did you see about this particular one that looked useful to you? Uh, one thing that Common Core emphasizes and, and that writing needs needs to have is that when you have a topic uh, you want to be providing evidence and, and details to support it and I always think for a parent I mean, we don't necessarily know what is good writing so looking at the example is really helpful because then you can say they have t this topic that they have to stay on and they have a few details about it and um, and it's just like I was going to say if you if you forget go to great schools or look at a book I was going you know look at a book that's um, maybe an ex a, a, a narrative sorry a nonfiction expository book and see how like the pages will each have their own content topic maybe it's the canopy and then they have the supporting details the evidence for their topic and it's the same for for second grade writers as it is for adult writers so um, help them have their topic and their supporting details and don't get too hung up at all on correcting mistakes in punctuation or spelling because really the emphasis and I think the video does this really well the emphasis is on 
what what they're writing, not the mechanics of if they're spacing it well or you know using the correct punctuation. Right, right. So, what do you think the one thing is parents need to know about helping their children children learn to write? If there was just like one thing that spanned across the ages, what what would be that one thing you'd want to every parent to understand? I so I see mistakes as opportunities for learning, but parents. We have to be very careful that we don't overcorrect mistakes because it really can discourage kids. So if the one if you can find something really good about their writing, then I would really focus on that and maybe only correct one thing. Because you want to praise what they're doing well. And remember, the teacher is going to continue to instruct them and they'll get better at that. But what we want is for them to feel confident as writers and and so you can build them up with, with the praise of what they're writing about, remembering the content is the most important thing. So for a writer who's not very confident, or you know, and a, a parent who says, like, I don't know how to write, and I'm yeah. supposed to teach writing, how do I do that? What's the kind of activity that parents can do where they don't really feel confident about, like, oh, I'm an editor. Here, I'll fix your writing. Right. Yeah. The first thing you can do is ask your child to talk about what they're going to write about at any age. This can be from your, you know, surly fifth grader or your your kindergartner, because sometimes it helps clarify the thinking of the child thinking if they can talk about it. So they're seeing if you're seeing if they have a beginning, middle, and end. Maybe they wander off and realize, oh, I I, I straight off topic. If they're um, talking about rainforests, for example, and then they remember that their friend read a book about a rainforest, you can help them in the talking part stay focused so that when they're ready to write, they sort of have their ideas organized in their head already. Right, I see that in the videos a lot. There's just a ton of like talking about the subject matter and there's not a lot of, it's not all head down writing out things yeah. and correcting the grammar and that sort of thing. That's really at the end of the process. It really is, yeah. Um, do you think there's mistakes that parents make about helping their children write? What, what would you say are the most common mistakes? I think we're often too hard on our kids, we, and we focus on the end, the end process, like you were saying, what uh, the corrections that need to be made with spelling. Our job is to support, maybe teach a little bit, thing that they can learn, but really support and encourage, give feedback for the good things that they're doing. That's great. That's great. Um, you mentioned under Common Core, kids are being learned to taught to write in a much more sort of formal process, teaching them to back everything up by evidence. My daughter, who was in fourth grade at the time, um, was given a form to fill out to prepare her to write. So every argument had to have three pieces of evidence, and every evidence piece of evidence had to have three details. And then she came home. She had loved writing, and she came home. She's like. I can't write anymore. It's changing my brain. I think she was learning something good, but the formality was so new to her that she felt like it was impinging on her self-expression. What do you think you can do for kids who are kind of reacting against this new form formal teaching process, which in the long run will help them, but right now feels like a you know a series of strictures? Yeah, I I know it can feel really. Um difficult. Sometimes it's helpful to just drop, jot down words instead of the whole sentences. Um, but there's also other, you know, you can do note cards, you can do different kind of mapping activities, see if the teacher will allow you to do different things for the more right brain learners so that they're drawing the ideas out in a different map form than, you know, maybe an outline form. But it, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of getting used to it and just keep encouraging them that there are many purposes for writing and this is just one to inform someone but that their opportunity as a writer is to make the in, the information fun to read about so how can they make it fun even within the structure that's the goal if and they're remembering their audience their audience is their peers so if they're going to write about um, fish or whatever their topic is then how can you make it fun and and kind of set that challenge for them for them. 
Well, that's a great segue to one of our readers asked, um, our, our viewers asked, are, do you have any specific tips for making a school assignment fun? <laughs> it, um, specific tips. Well, sometimes it just depends on that kid. You know, you have to sort of know your kid. So it could be that with my ADHD kid, we have to take a lot of breaks, so it makes it more fun. So if you get a paragraph done, then we can take a break and do something else. We could play a game. Uh, with my more artsy-fartsy daughter, she wants to um, draw first and then write. So we might add that in, even though it's not in the assignment. It sort of has to match what your kid likes to do and who they are, how they learn. But um, some kids even, if it's so overwhelming, you might even say, well, I will take dictation. Why don't you tell me? I'll take dictation and you can rewrite it later because that's so laborious for some kids. So we as parents can just uh, see what our child needs and then try to um, be creative thinkers outside of the box. Yeah. Um, one of the things that my child's experiencing right now in their writing class is they get the kids together to argue their perspectives. So they're doing teaching argumentative writing nice. and whatever they'll pe they'll make sure that one kid's arguing for dogs and the other one's arguing for cats. Mm -hmm. And then they pair them together in little teams of the cats and the dogs and they, they get to argue. And they, they're supposed to stay on point and use their evidence. I thought that was a really fun way to realize that evidence can be sort of lively and engaging is to put it in the context of debate. Exactly, uh, debate team in elementary school. <laughs> yeah. um, do you think um, assignments seem to fo focus less on personal experiences now? Um, why, why do you think there's a move away from the focus on personal experiences and that, you know, how I spent my summer vacation kind of narratives? I don't really know. I think it's unfortunate because strong writers start with what they know and they know you know kids are natural storytellers so they come to school with this like oh yesterday I saw this and I did this and I had my baby sister did this and they need that's the experiences they can just write a ton about so I think there still needs to be I think that's what's missing in Common Core but I still think most teachers do that anyway because they know there's many purposes for writing, not just the report writing, the the um, expository writing. So I think that um, Common Core is just a starting place, and then you can hopefully have the everything, all types of genres of writing. But I think I'm not really sure if, if, if it's just yeah. because we have to read infor informative text, so that's what they're hoping to connect it with the the reading and the writing. Right, right. Uh, my 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 experience is watch and looking at the Common Core is that. A lot of people think that all of the new Common Core is informational, but it really isn't. There should be argumentative writing, which is really opinion writing. Mm -hmm. There should be informational writing, and there should be narrative writing. And mm -hmm. they're supposed to do all of those in elementary school grades. Mm -hmm. But I think that some people just think there's only going to be there's only one of them. Um, so if uh, you, you, I think a lot of kids are, a lot of parents are wondering how do, you know, kids who are in kindergarten or first grade and they can barely write their name or they can barely write a sentence and then they're being asked to write an essay. What does that look like? Does an essay written by a first grader, is that really, are they really forcing kids to write essays or is it something that's more sort of multimedia? Well, I think you're, you know your website and the videos show it really well because it is it is really simple um, con writing it's basically conveying information at their level with drawings and and that's perfect for a first grader and a kindergartner and even if the kindergartner only writes the beginning sounds or the beginning and the ending sounds of the word that is that counts that's called invented spelling and that's totally appropriate and what they should be doing and do you think the teachers are going to be like, no, fix every piece of spelling, or do 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 good 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 elementary school teachers understand that that's part of the process, and you don't have to fix it all? 
Exactly, because it's building fluency that they suddenly begin to see themselves as a, a writer who can just write a story figuring out the words. And I, I'll tell you, most kindergarten and first grade teachers can even read all those words because they know what the child is trying to say. If the child's trying to spell beautiful, for example, and they don't have the ba or the d sound, maybe they put in something really weird, an F or a T, then that's when teachers can say, there's a problem here and maybe there needs to be some additional you know, information or testing. The child's not hearing the letter sound or doesn't know the letter sound, but, but good teachers use that as an assessment. You know, and they probably wouldn't correct it or get mad, but they would figure out how they could help that child. Right, so phonetically correct invented spelling is often a sign that it, you, it's a sign that the kid is connecting the letters to the sounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talked a little bit about creating a space in your home for writing. It sounds really luxurious, like every child needs their own writing studio, but, but mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? Well, I think it can be as simple as um, a table in your kitchen that you have materials for art and for writing. You can have blank books or just blank paper. And, and it's so open-ended that the kids can go to this space that they have and draw and write and create and then they're building up their confidence, they're practicing what they're learning at school and it's really it's really a fun thing to do. My kids, um, I would rotate art supplies, sometimes I'd put in the watercolor, sometimes I would have markers, so then they would be inspired to do different kinds of writing depending on what they were doing with the art part. Mm -hmm. Or cards, making cards, or that kind of thing. There's a really cute um, activity on your website right now about uh, uh, inspiring a, a child to create a story using little little toys or yeah little chickens or something. Yeah, those Easter chicks. You know, we just it was an impulse purchase at the craft store, and then my daughter decided that she was going to take pictures of them and then use the pictures, the photos, to write a story. So this is a different form of not um, drawing, but it's still it's still like drawing. It's the art. And um, one time she took her favorite stuffed animal, and we did a day in the life of her bunny. And we went all over and took all these pictures. We went to the grocery store, and Bunny was picking out the. Th and then I printed them out, and she wrote all of that down. It it was gosh, she was only five at the time, so it didn't look like regular writing, but it was wonderful. It was a beginning, middle, and end, which is what I was looking for and, and good practice for her. Right, and probably made her excited about, like, I can create a book, too. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you've talked a little bit about really encouraging kids and giving them praise, but don't you also have to give them some, um, you know, Sort of constructive criticism. How do you how do you balance that? Do you have any kind of how do you know if you're being too harsh or too or too lax when you're helping kids with their writing? I think you want to see some growth the next time. So if you're saying this is the piece of writing, and do you notice that you're missing some um, some periods, for example, or do you notice that you don't have any evidence for for this topic in this paragraph? And if they're not improving it then maybe you're not telling them enough information. Maybe that is too lax. So you're trying to make sure that you're teaching them and giving them examples so that they can improve. But if they're super discouraged and all the time, you know, really resistant, then you want to back off a little bit because then you're maybe being a little too harsh. It's 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 kid by kid basis. Um, every kid's so unique. And you talked about a a, a, a sandwich. Was it? Oh, yeah, a compliment sandwich, yeah. So I do this with adults, too, sometimes, you know. You go to the store and you're really mad because <laughs> something broke. <laughs> you say something good, and then you ask for what, you know, that could be better, and then you say something good again. So I like how you, sometimes with some kids writing, it's so hard. I like how you wrote your name on the paper. <laughs> That's the only good thing I can think of. And could you remember to... Um, 
stay on the topic of fish. Where could you take out sentences that don't relate to the fish topic? And then also, I think your handwriting, I mean, sometimes it's, or you can say, I think you did a good job with your um, topic or your title. So then you have the compliment, criticism, compliment. Right. That's on a good right. note. <laughs> yeah. It's a good, it's a good uh, skill for life, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one, uh, Jumana asked, how can I help my child organize his thoughts? Mm -hmm. Organization is really a key uh, issue when you start to try to present ideas in an essay form. And a lot of kids struggle with that. So what are some of the techniques and, and tricks of the trade that parents can use to help their kids who are just really disorganized? Um, I try to make it as visual as I can, and that's why a lot of teachers like to use thinking maps or story maps so that you can say, and or even note cards, so this information is all about this topic on this note card, and this other note card is, you know, a different topic, or it can be boxes drawn out in your thinking map. That is really often the most helpful for kids to organize their thinking, but you can get also make it make it action-packed so one room is all about um, how fish are um, how fish live in the water and that's one topic and then you could even put the details on the pieces of paper in the room and then you go to another room and this is another topic about fish is that it's that fish are um, lay eggs and something like that life cycle and details in there so you want to make it uh, as, as clear for them that they can see it and maybe do it as before they write so they can understand what you're talking about because it is kind of weird and and even with beginning middle and end sometimes I've done where I will do a read a story and I will stop at the middle and I'll say the end and the kids will go what okay what makes an end so you can always talk about kids while you're you know with reading with them or doing other activities any book you can do it, you know, a regular picture book and talk about how it, it tells the story from the beginning to the end or, um, you know, the books that you have that are nonfiction. This one happens to be about fashion. How did they organize it? And it's on this page is on one topic, this section's on another topic. So you're also reading as a writer. So that you're using all the things that you can to help support them in their writing, not just the time when they're assigned that one report or, or whatever it is. Right, right. It sounds like sometimes taking what, what when you're reading with them or if they're reading on their own, kind of playing a game with them to make them realize they actually do understand a little bit about organization. Yeah. Because if a, if a child reads an unorganized book or a, or, or, or a book that's out of order, they will notice mm -hmm. somehow sometimes when it comes to their own writing they'll struggle. The other thing that our videos really do well is it really shows these incredibly expert writing teachers help students break things down into really small steps and they're using the note card approach mm -hmm. to getting different pieces of information onto note cards and then having the kids reshuffle them and they'll have them reshuffle them sometimes two or three times to show that there's not just one way of presenting information. You can rethink it and have a different reason for putting them in a different order. So it's a nice way to think about that organization is there's not one right way to do it. Correct. Um, so my uh, grade schooler loved writing when she was in kindergarten. But in second grade, she now has declared that she hates it. So what can I do to help her love it again? This is from uh, one, of our, one of our viewers. This, is, uh, this, is, this happens <laughs> so often, and it's, it's one of the hardest things to get kids to just sit down and write. I just don't, don't know if you can force them to do it. So you have to sort of like... Um, put on your clown hat and do a song and dance and figure out a way to make it really fun which is so you're doing mad libs with them you're writing stories and um, maybe you're telling stories 
and then you decide, oh, and let's write this down. This will be so fun. But you have to use your very best acting skills and really sell it because it's not um, something that they're going to want to do. You might not even want to do it. But um, if you are, <laughs> let's see, there's a lot of different um, storytelling cards you can even get or um, little, you can use little um, toys. So if you're doing whatever they're into, always try to go with their interests. If they're into Legos, get their Lego toys out, tell a story, write it down. So that you're connecting with what they like to do and helping them see that it doesn't have to be a horrible thing. <laughs> right, and it's also introducing writing as part of play rather than always as an assignment. Yeah. 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 Um, what would you say to a there, one of our parents has asked, what, how do you get them to start when they're stuck on sentence one? That concept of like the blank page, they've got one sentence written or they're just staring at the blank page. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Go back to talking, tell them what they want to, ask them what they want to say. And if they don't know, uh, you can give them some suggestions or take a break and come back to it. Sometimes that's the biggest thing. Or you can say, skip the first sentence, especially as kids do this with a title. They can't think of a title. Don't, don't write the title. Don't write the first sentence. Write the rest and do the first sentence last. Won't that be silly? Uh, so uh, trick them in a way that they won't keep getting stuck. And help them get unstuck. Write it backwards. Write it in mirror writing. So you're trying to, you know, make it, um, here, I know what, here's a silly pen, a uh, sparkly pen, write it with this, see if that helps, that could be magical. Right, right, I think that's really great to see, like, that if they're stuck, take a step back, it's not just drive on in and force them to fill that page Tears. with words. <laughs> Tears start to flow and it doesn't really help. Um, no. So how do you help a child with ADHD and dyslexia when they're struggling with writing? What are the kind of key um, tips? You mentioned that one of your children has uh, ADHD, mm -hmm. and so you've probably been through this in the home and as well as professionally. So what, what would you say are the kind of key um, strategies for dealing with a kid who's already got this huge challenge? Mm -hmm. Remove as many distractions as you can. That's the first thing. Take a lot of breaks and also um, find ways for them to move. So my my daughter uh, will sit on a bouncy ball and that helps her get a little bit of movement in. And her writing looks terrible anyway, so I don't even care because um, it's going to be messy when she's on a bouncy ball. Uh, she also has one of those seat cushions that's kind of bouncy. Um, and she, the other thing is in uh, and I've talked to some ADHD coaches about this, is I don't always make her do it all. I sometimes help her with it. I'll, she'll do dictation because it is laborious. She is such a slow processor and she gets so distracted. Her homework taking her three hours versus another child in her class that's taking 30 minutes, that's not what the teacher wants. The teacher just wants her to practice what she's learning. So, so mom and dad can help with the ADHD kids sometimes. Not that they will do the whole assignment for them, but sometimes it's taking the dictation or shortening the assignment, working with the teacher to shorten mm -hmm. the assi assignment, something like that, so that it doesn't become overwhelming. And then certainly with the dyslexia, that's a whole nother, you know, ball of wax because there's, it's, it's even more of a struggle. Right. Yeah. And I, I feel, also it sounds like what you're saying is that when kids have either dyslexia or, or ADHD that, um, you, if you can bridge it and support, the, so that they still go through the thinking process, but yeah. you help them with the mechanics, like by taking dictation, like by not worrying about, you know, even if they're fifth grade, not worrying about their spelling right away, that 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 you want them to experience like sort of the thinking part of writing and not focus on the mechanics of writing which are so hard for them that it's like an impediment to doing the thinking. Yes, you go back to what's the assignment and how can I help my child with that goal and not all the other things that are interfering, you know, because it's oftentimes 
they, it's like in math, it's easier to see because you can say, my child can show that he knows this information in, in 10 um, num, you know, problems instead of 100 because the, the 10 takes him as long as the other kids doing 100. In writing, it's a little harder, so you have to think, how can I bridge that gap and, and support my child? And they learn the main thing that the teacher wants them to learn. Right. So um, I really appreciate your time today. If there was one thing that you wanted parents to remember about this last half hour, what would you tell them? Even if they don't, if you don't feel like a writer, it's okay because you actually know more than you think you do. You you read, you're a storyteller, your kids are storytellers. So just go in helping your child with writing with confidence and when in doubt, look at your your books that you have at home for ideas of how to help your kids with writing because these are all examples of what good writing is. That's great. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's been wonderful to talk to you. And um, we're going to post this talk on the website and share it out. It will also be on YouTube. And I encourage everybody to check out the writing videos and, um, and go on to Melissa's website, Imagination Soup. She has some incredibly great book lists, actually. And it looks like you read all the book lists the books that you read for every age, and so it's they're really, really fun to read. Um, and I appreciate all your time, and it was great talking to you. Thank you, Carol. All right, well, see you all later, and we're going to have another uh, reading-focused Milestones viewing party in a couple of weeks, and stay tuned for information about that. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye.